slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Starlab. Here, Starlab Research Director, Dr. Maura Cassidy, and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, ISA, watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. This week, the men and women of Starlab become entangled in the adventure of the Egyptian necklace, an intergalactic detective story in the Sherlock Holmes tradition on Alien Worlds. British Museum freighter, Nile Delta, commanded by Captain Jack Lemus, is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the priceless King Tut exhibit, sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier as part of an interplanetary cultural exchange program. Nile Delta to Starlab Control. This is Starlab. Go ahead, Nile Delta. Is that you, Jerry? Affirmative, Captain. Are you planning to dock at Star Lab on your way home? No, not this time. An ISA tanker came up from Cannabis 12 and refueled us on the other side of Saturn. No, I just wanted to say hello and invite you around for a visit if uh, you're ever in London. My wife's got quite a lovely sister she's trying to marry off. And I've got some 40-year-old brandy that'll lift you right out of your boots. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation, Captain. I'll take you up on it the first chance I get. I'll be looking for you. Nile Delta, clear. Starlab, out. That alien ship's back again, Captain. 3,500 meters off the port bow. Have you tried to contact her? Uh, we tried, but she still doesn't respond. All right, let's have another look at her. Full magnification this time. Hey, she's a beauty, isn't she? All white and slim like that. Do you recognize any of the markings, Tony? Um... Uh, wait a minute. What's that on the tail fin? The sun symbol? No, no, just below it. The blue and gold bird with its wings spread out. Isn't that the same Hold as... on. She's dropping down a bit. Tony, she's been damaged. Top of the hull, amidships. There go the SOS flares. Let's get up alongside of her and see if we can help. As the Nile Delta's navigator maneuvers the red and gray freighter into a side-by-side -side position with the damaged alien ship, Captain Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill put on bright blue pressure suits and enter the freighter's airlock. A moment later, an enclosed metal flex walkway slowly telescopes from the Nile Delta's airlock to an access hatch which has irised open in the hull of the fluorescent white alien spacecraft. You're very generous to give us your time and kindness. Well, hello. Who are you? My name is Piratep. I'm glad you didn't abandon us. Yours is the only vessel we've seen since the accident. When did it happen? Three days ago, and some of our mariners have been injured. Is there a healer aboard your vessel? Y yes, there is, and we have a complete medical facility as well. Then if you'll please follow me, we can begin transferring our injured to your ship. If you wish to remove your helmets, you'll be in no danger. We're oxygen breathers too. Whew, well, that's better, isn't it? Aye, it was getting a bit stuffy in there. This is Amontev. Which of you is Captain Lemus? Well, I am a... How do you know my name? We know the names of everyone aboard the Nile Delta. We also know it carries the afterlife treasures and mummified body of Tutankhamun. Your ship isn't damaged at all, is it? No, it isn't. Don't look now, Captain. But I think we've been set up for a little of the old smash and grab. 
What the bloody hell do you want with the King Tut treasure? It only has value on Earth. It's worthless out here. We don't want the entire treasure, Captain. Only the beaded floral necklace. It's not mine to give you. And even if it were, I wouldn't. I have a rule against being overly charitable to anyone who makes a fool of me or my friends. Come on, Tony, let's get back to the ship. Please, Captain, don't force me to use this weapon. A weapon? A tiny little thing? Let's get out of here, Captain. Amantep? Stop them, Piratel. Tony! Tony! Museum freighter Nile Delta is returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasure of the Egyptian boy king Tutankhamun. Midway between Earth and Saturn, a damaged alien spacecraft appears and fires SOS flares. Nile Delta Captain Jack Lemus and first mate Tony Cargill board the alien ship to offer assistance. But inside, they discover they have fallen into a trap set by the aliens who want a beaded floral necklace from the King Tut treasure. An hour later on Star Lab, Dr. Maura Cassidy and SET Captain John Graydon, not yet aware of the Nile Delta incident, enter the vestibule of Star Lab's visual media theater. John, how long has Buddy been in there? About six hours. Six hours? What's he watching, the outtakes from Gravity's Rainbow? Oh, no, that was yesterday. Uh, Sunday, he sat through five old Stanley Kubrick films, and Monday, it was a Daffy Duck festival. Uh, what he's watching today is anybody's guess. Maybe he fell asleep. Well, I wish he'd sleep a little faster. We're going to be late. Hi, Maura. Hi, John. Buddy. Buddy, didn't your mother ever tell you that if you watched too many movies, your face would break out and you'd go blind? Very funny. Uh, I think you've got that mixed up with something else, Maura. I do? What? Uh, I'll tell you later. Uh, well, buddy, uh, what'd you see today? The Guiding Light, All My Children, and Search for Tomorrow. They're television soap operas from the 60s and 70s. Soap operas? Why do they call them that? Were they musicals about people getting clean? <laughs> Not exactly, Maura. They were mostly about people getting dirty. <laughs> Dr. Cassidy, please contact the control bridge. Oh, we'll never make the lecture at this rate. Have they repaired the intercom terminal in the theater, buddy? Well, it was working this morning. Hmm. Be back in a minute. What did you think of those music tapes Ingrid brought back from Calibria? I was listening to one when I turned in last night. Uh, you know, the one with all the voices? The hymn to the vanished canals? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I fell asleep while it was still running, and... I dreamed about kaleidoscope faces and stained glass animals all night. Incredible. Let's get up to the bridge. Something's happened to the Nile Delta. When we woke up, we were back aboard the Nile Delta. The rest of my chaps were still knocked out, and the necklace and the aliens were gone. Is the necklace the only thing missing? Uh, we don't know yet. We're still checking the manifest. Have you notified the museum yet? I'm going to do that just as soon as... Stand by, Star Lab. Dr. Cassidy, our medical officer, Dr. Lomax, he's just come up from the cargo bay. He said the aliens opened the coffin, unwrapped the mummy down to the neck, and took a tissue sample from its face. A tissue sample? Is Dr. Lomax absolutely certain about that? He's positive, Dr. Cassidy, and he's holding up a little gold surgical instrument they dropped. We'll put it in a safe place and we'll analyze it when you get here. See you around midnight, Captain. Star Lab out. Nile Delta, clear. Buddy, John, what do you think? Well, we've got about nine hours before the Nile Delta gets here. Let's go down to the library and pull the King Tut tapes out of the Egyptology section. Maybe we can turn up something. Why not? Meanwhile, at the Royal British Museum in London, 
Sir Dorian Bradford Gray, the museum's director, receives word of the Nile Delta incident. Fifteen minutes later, Sir Dorian reports the incident to British Prime Minister Lord Henry Gladstone Baggs. Within the hour, Lord Henry enters Buckingham Palace and conveys the news to Her Majesty, Queen Victoria III. And what about the aliens who perpetrated this awful crime, Lord Henry? Does the Ministry have any idea who they are? Uh, I'm afraid we're still in the dark about that, Your Majesty. Oh. Hand us the royal pen and ink, Lord Henry, and some royal stationery, too. This incident requires the services of England's most famous consulting detective. Agreed? Oh, yes, by all means, Your Majesty, by all means. Now, let's see. From Victoria Regina the Third. Yes, yes, Your Majesty. Sonar T. Oh. Any shadow of the My dear Mr. Foom, a matter of some urgency has arisen which requires your immediate and undivided attention. Meanwhile, in the heart of London's West End, Sonar T. Foom and his associate, Dr. McGuffin Drone, are spending a quiet afternoon in their rooms at 221B Pennybaker Street. Say something, Drone. I really must protest, Foom. That instrument of yours had my London Gazette vibrating so rapidly, I could scarcely read today's news. Oh, please forgive me, Drone, but you know how restless I am when there's nothing afoot to test my keen powers of observation and deduction. And music does, after all, soothe the savage beast. Well, if it's savage beasts you're interested in soothing, perhaps you should consider taking up residence at the zoo. Careful, Drone. I think you're skating on rather thin ice with that one. Just a moment. Do my ears deceive me, or is that Mrs. Hudson's cat-like tread upon the stair? Yes, that's Mrs. Hudson, all right. No question about it. Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Why, Mr. Foom, how on earth did you know it was me? Elementary, my dear Mrs. Hudson. There are just the three of us in the entire house. The doors and windows are latched from the inside. Dr. Drone and myself are, as you can plainly see, here in this room, which left only you, Mrs. Hudson, unaccounted for. <laughs> oh, Mr. Foom, you never cease to amaze me. I also perceive... An envelope between the thumb and forefinger of your right hand, Mrs. Hudson. White, six inches square, addressed to me in violet ink. Oh, my, yes, I nearly forgot. It just arrived. May I have the envelope, please? Thank you. Hmm. A message from none other than Her Royal Majesty. You don't say. Her Royal Majesty. How did you know that, Foom? The return address, my dear drone. I recognize the royal zip code. Your powers of observation are absolutely uncanny, Foom. Yes. And now... Egad, drone. The Nile Delta's been set upon by alien beings, and King Tutankhamun's floral necklace has been purloined. Her Majesty requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. Mrs. Hudson, call the airfield and tell Smattering to prepare the Bellerophon. Right away, Mr. Foam. Now, let's get our equipment sorted out, Drone. The game is afoot and a new adventure is at hand. The Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta is returning to Earth from Thanatos. 
Aboard the freighter, the treasures of Tutankhamun sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier for exhibition. Midway between Earth and Saturn, the freighter is boarded by aliens who steal the King Tut floral necklace and take a tissue sample from the face of the boy king's mummy. When news of the Nile Delta incident reaches Queen Victoria III, she quickly notifies consulting detective Sonar T. Foom. Let's get our equipment sorted out, drone. Her Majesty respectfully requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. At the Pennybaker Street tube station, Foom and Drone board an urban link train that carries them to a small spaceport near Croydon. Crossing the field to launch pad six, they board Foom's powerful multi-atmosphere cruiser, the Bellerophon, England's most sophisticated privately owned spacecraft. 30 seconds later, the Bellerophon jets out over the grey waters of the English Channel, banks up into a glacier-like mass of white clouds, and rockets away towards Starland. Let me know when Erica finishes replacing the AE-35 module, huh? Will do, Dr. Cassidy. See you later. Nine o'clock. Well, time to feed my fish. Hi, Winston. Hi, Emmett. Hi, Orpheus. Dr. Cassidy. Hi, Dorothy. Yes, Dorothy, what is it? I have a transmission coming through from ISA headquarters. It's Commissioner White. I'll take it here, patch him through. Ma, I just received a transmission from the British Prime Minister. Sonar T. Foom is on his way up to help with the Nile Delta investigation. Good. I've always wanted to meet that man. When did he leave? Oh, about an hour ago. He should be docking in a few minutes. He and his partner officially represent the British government in this case, Mara, so give him all the help you can. All right, Commissioner. I'll keep you posted. Star Lab out. Good evening, Star Lab. This is the Bellerophon. Sonar T. Foom at the controls. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Bellerophon. What is Star Lab's rotational profile? Mm, 18 per minute on a variable axis of 0 0.3 degrees. Non-correctable. Thank you so much. At our present rate of speed and your present rate of rotation... I calculate our docking orbit insertion coordinates will be 208 degrees at subvector 671. Mm, uh, hold on a minute. That's right. Did you calculate that in your head? Of course. That's amazing. Uh, nothing to it, really. Now, what do you have in the way of empty docking bays? Uh... Number 14. Thank you so much. And will you please inform Dr. Cassidy that we'll be there in one minute, 13 seconds. <laughs> will do. Star Lab, out. All right, Jerry, have Polly bring them to my quarters as soon as they dock. Huh? Okay, Mara. Well, you two look more red-eyed than usual. Where have you been? We went back to the library after dinner and ran the King Tut tapes again. Did you come up with anything? Yeah. You know that blue and gold bird symbol Captain Lemus described? Uh, the one on the tail fin of the alien ship? Mm-hmm. We found one just like it on King Tut's ecclesiastical chair. What does the bird represent? Well, it's actually a sacred vulture, and it represents the goddess Nekebet, a guardian of Upper Egypt and protectress of childbirth. When Captain Lemus gets here, we should run his visual scanner tapes of the alien ship against the library tapes to see if the symbols match. And if they do? If they do, we've concocted a pretty bizarre theory to explain why. I'm listening. Well, if the symbols match, and this is strictly hypothetical now, if they match, then maybe the aliens aren't aliens after all. Maybe they're Egyptians. <laughs> Come on, you two. Modern Egypt isn't capable of the kind of technology Captain Lemus described. 
That's the bizarre part of the theory, Mora. We're not talking about modern Egypt. We're talking about ancient Egypt. Good evening, Dr. Cassidy. Mr. Foam. Dr. Drone. Welcome to Starlight. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Cassidy. Uh, Mara, please. And uh, who are these gentlemen, Mara? Space Exploration Team Captains John Grayton and Buddy Griff. Oh, how are you doing, Nice to meet you. I believe you were discussing the possibility that the aliens who boarded the Nile Delta might in fact be ancient Egyptians. Something like that, Doctor. It's a theory Buddy and John dreamed up. Hmm. I think we're going to get on very well indeed, gentlemen. Dr. Drone and myself were discussing a similar hypothesis not more than 15 minutes ago. You were? Congratulations, Captain Green. Uh, thank you, Captain Griff. Uh, Mr. Foom, with all due respect to you and Dr. Drone, I find it hard to believe that we're dealing with 3,300-year-old Egyptians. Not 3,300-year-old Egyptians, Mora, but rather the descendants of the high priests and priestesses who departed the earth following Tutankhamun's death. Departed the earth? How? The King Tut library tapes were full of references to skyships, Mora. Tell me, gentlemen, did your theory arise from Captain Lima's description of the Nekhebit symbol on the tail fin of the alien ship? That and the way the aliens were dressed. Yes. Captain Lemus convey those very same descriptions to the museum. Fascinating, isn't it? All right, suppose these aliens are what you think they are. That still doesn't explain the theft of the necklace or why they took a tissue sample from the mummy. The necklace is a puzzlement, Mora, but the tissue specimen isn't. It has long been our contention that the Egyptian kings were preserved for only one reason, so that in future their tissue could be rejuvenated for the purpose of monocellular replication. Cloning. You mean you actually believe these aliens intend to duplicate Tutankhamun? Ancient Egyptian religion was completely devoted to the concept of life after death, Mora. Most scholars and historians still maintain that the Egyptian afterlife was simply an abstract journey through an equally abstract underworld. Dr. Drone and myself think otherwise. We believe the Egyptian underworld was a metaphor to describe the very real fact of physical immortality. Thou art standing before Ra, who cometh from the east. His duration of life is infinite. His limit of life is everlastingness. Become one with Ra and be received into the land of eternal triumph. A verse from the Papyrus of Ani, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, telling of a journey into the regions of life everlasting, immortality, the most beautiful and mysterious of all alien worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Starlab. Here, Starlab Research Director Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless stars and planets that fill the silent distances beyond the giant space station. Last week's episode began when Captain Jack Lemus, commanding the Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta, notified Starlab that he was returning to Earth from the planet Thanatos. Aboard the freighter, the treasures of Tutankhamun, sent to Thanatos two weeks earlier as part of a cultural exchange program. Midway between Earth and Saturn, the freighter is boarded by aliens who steal the King Tut floral necklace and take a tissue sample from the face of the boy king's mummy. A tissue sample? Is Dr. Lomax absolutely certain about that? He's positive, Dr. Cassidy, and he's holding up a little gold surgical instrument they dropped. When news 
news of the Nile Delta incident reaches Queen Victoria III, she notifies England's most famous consulting detective, Sonar T. Foom. Her Majesty requests that we go to Star Lab at once and assist in the investigation of this beastly crime. Meanwhile, on Star Lab, SET captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff research the Egyptology section of Star Lab's library. Did you come up with anything? Yeah. You know that blue and gold bird symbol Captain Lemus described? Uh, the one on the tail fin of the alien ship? Mm hmm. We found one just like it on King Tut's ecclesiastical chair. When Captain Lemus gets here, we should run his visual scanner tapes of the alien ship against the library tapes to see if the symbols match. And if they do? If they match, then maybe the aliens aren't aliens after all. Maybe they're Egyptians. A few minutes later, Sonar T. Foom and his associate Dr. McGuffin Drone arrive at Star Lab, and when Mora tells them about John and Buddy's theory... Hmm... I think we're going to get on very well indeed, gentlemen. Dr. Drone and myself were discussing a similar hypothesis not more than 15 minutes ago. All right, suppose these aliens are what you think they are. That still doesn't explain the theft of the necklace or why they took a tissue sample from the mummy. The necklace is a puzzlement, Mora, but the tissue specimen isn't. It has long been our contention that the Egyptian kings were preserved for only one reason, so that in future their tissue could be rejuvenated for the purpose of monocellular replication. Cloning. And now, the conclusion of the adventure of the Egyptian necklace, an interplanetary detective story in the Sherlock Holmes tradition on Alien Worlds. <laughs> We ran the Egyptology tapes all the way back to the first dynasty, but we couldn't find a connection with any other civilization. A lot of theories, but nothing definite. What sort of theories? Well, some historians think dynastic Egypt may have evolved from ancient Samaria because of the similarity of their religious deities and astrological calendar. And a few renegade scholars even hypothesized that the Egyptians were the survivors of Atlantis. Look, before we get carried away by all these theories, I'd like to know one thing. Aside from religious deities and sky ships, did these civilizations share a common philosophy about where they came from? Yes, Mora, they did. They all believed they were the children of highly evolved beings who originally came down from the stars. The Limehouse Express to Star Lab Control. The Limehouse Express? Where do people come up with these names? Who knows? Uh, this is Star Lab. Go ahead, Limehouse Express. Good evening. It's Jerry, isn't it? That's right. Who are you? What's your position? My position is that I never state my position. What's the problem, Limehouse Express? Uh, no problem, Dr. Cassidy. Now, if you don't mind, I wish to speak to Mr. Fu. Does he know you? Oh, my, yes. He knows me very well indeed. I'm Professor Moriarty. England's most famous consulting detective, Sonar T. Foom, and his associate, Dr. McGuffin Drone, arrive at Star Lab to investigate the theft of the King Tut floral necklace from the Royal British Museum freighter Nile Delta. Half an hour later, Starlab Control receives a transmission from the Limehouse Express, a mysterious spacecraft that refuses to give its position. Have you tried to locate him with a tracer beacon? He's neutralizing our tracer beacon with a scrambler beam that he's transmitting along with his radio signal. He's too far away for the scanners to pick him up. Very clever, Moriarty. Very clever indeed. <laughs> Nearly as clever as you, eh, Foom? Well, I wouldn't go quite that far, Drone. No, no, I, I suppose not. Open B channel, Jerry. Go ahead, Mr. Foom. So, Professor Moriarty, 
we meet again. Ah, my dear Foom, it's so good to hear your voice. Interplanetary crime is so boring without an adversary of your caliber. What exactly is on your criminal mind? I'm in the mood for a bit of cat and mouse with you, Foom, so I thought it might interest you to know that the Tutankhamun necklace is in my possession. And the aliens who took it are being held aboard my ship. You mean the Egyptians who took it, don't you, Moriarty? Very good, Foom, very good indeed. Well, I see by the old atomic clock on the wall that we've run out of time. I do, however, want to leave you with these inspiring words. Catch me, if you can. Limehouse Express, out. <laughs> Limehouse Express, indeed. Why, does that name mean something? Moriarty's great-great-grandfather was the most cunning criminal genius of his time. His headquarters were somewhere in the Limehouse section of London. And like his great-great-grandson spacecraft, the location of the old professor's headquarters was a constant source of mystery. If the Egyptians are working for Moriarty, why is he holding them prisoner? It just doesn't make sense. I think it's safe to assume that they were cooperating with Moriarty rather than working for him. It's obvious now that he was using them to get the necklace for himself. Oh, and we're right back at the beginning, aren't we? The beginning? Of course. Mora, you're positively inspirational. I am? Indeed you are. Drone, I think it's time we contacted the museum and had a chat with Sir Dorian. Something tells me he knows more about the origins of this case than he thinks he does. Meanwhile, near Mars, the Limehouse Express, a huge metallic gray flying wing, moves into a parking orbit between the Martian moons of Deimos and Phobos. Imprisoned in a storage compartment near the flying wing's hangar bay are Piratep and Amentef, the two extraterrestrial Egyptians responsible for the theft of the necklace. It was foolish and undignified, Amentef. The two of us sitting in Sir Dorian's office, wearing those absurd Earth costumes, trying to deceive him the way the professor eventually deceived us. Perhaps we can still redeem ourselves. It is apparent from the way the professor talks about this man, Foom, that they are deadly enemies. If we could reach Star Lab and explain to Foom why we need the necklace, he might be sympathetic. But we'll never reach the hangar bay without a weapon. We have a weapon, Piratev. A photon pistol. I hid it in my boot as our ship was being taken aboard. Then you knew the professor was manipulating us. He's coming, Amantev. Hide the pistol. Well, how are the children of the sun this evening? Why have you brought the necklace here? I'll be taking it to Anshar in a few hours, and I thought perhaps you'd like to have one last look at it. Be very careful with it, won't you, my dear? Amontev, there's only one guard in the corridor. All right. What is it? Who are you? Take the necklace into the ship. I'll open the launch doors. are coming. Take the necklace to stop
John Starlab, Sonar T. Foom, and Dr. McGuffin Drone sit in a conference room on G-level, analyzing a video image Sir Dorian has transmitted from the museum's employee index terminal. Drone, there's something rather curious about this picture of Wilhelmina Hammersmith. Look closely at the eyes. What's your professional opinion? Well, the left eye is artificial. Now, Look at the ring finger on the left hand. Oh, here, let me magnify it. What do you see? A deep circular impression, as if a ring had been removed. A platinum serpent's ring, perhaps? Great Scott. Great Scott indeed, my dear drone. This is not a 70-year-old Egyptologist named Wilhelmina Hammersmith. This is none other than Professor Moriarty himself. What an extraordinary masquerade. Yes. Wearing this disguise, Moriarty appears at the museum and presents false credentials. Impressed with these documents, Sir Dorian gives Moriarty a post in the Egyptian antiquities section. And it is here that he learns the highly confidential facts of the Nile Delta's Thanatos schedule. But didn't Sir Dorian say that this Hammersmith woman was in his office? when the Egyptian couple was there trying to buy the necklace? Yes, and two days later, Wilhelmina Hammersmith Moriarty resigns, and the Egyptian couple are never seen again. Now, let me see. The two Egyptians who boarded the Nile Delta are obviously the same two who were in Sir Dorian's office. When they leave the museum, Moriarty follows them. Escaping from a prison compartment aboard Professor Moriarty's Limehouse Express, the necklace safely in their possession, Piratep and Amantef dash to their ship in the hangar bay of Moriarty's huge metallic gray flying wing. Take the necklace into the ship. I'll open the launch doors. But as the thick metal doors slide open, they trigger a series of security alarms. And before Piratet can reach the ship, a squad of Moriarty's guards enter the hangar bay and open fire with laser rifles. Piratet! As Piratet falls, blood streaming from her face, Amantef closes the hatch of the ship and blasts off for Starland. Nine hours later... Time for breakfast already. I've just been having a chat with a very interesting and charming Egyptian gentleman. I thought you might like to meet him. What on earth are you talking about? The Egyptian ship, my dear drone. It docked 20 minutes ago. You're pulling my leg. are data storage terminals. Here, look through the lens. Good heavens. Microcircuits. The beads are emanation scanners, Doctor, that sensed and recorded the spiritual aura of the kings who wore the necklace. The necklace was brought to Earth by our ancestors and passed from dynasty to dynasty in the hope that it would one day be worn by a spiritually perfect king. A king who would then be replicated and given immortality. Tutankhamun is that king. Look, you said you didn't know King Tut's tomb had been discovered until just a few weeks ago. How did your people lose track of its location in the first place? The last Egyptian dynasty ended with the death of King Nechneb. When he died, the necklace was sealed in his sarcophagus. 
one year later, on the first day of the new solar equinox, our ancestors returned from Nahe Shem in a ceremonial funeral ship. As the ship orbited Earth, an inner circle high priestess went down in a small lander. She recovered the necklace, analyzed the white beads, and saw that of all the recorded spiritual auras, Tutankhamun's had been the most perfect and powerful. Placing the necklace in Tutankhamun's tomb, she returned to the lander, contacted the ship, and reported that it was Tutankhamun who would be given immortality. But before she could give the location of the tomb, her transmission was interrupted. She was never seen or heard from again. Limehouse Express to Starlab. I'll talk to him, Mora. Well, if it isn't the notorious Wilhelmina Hammersmith. Don't be tiresome, Holmes. I know, Amontef is there. We tracked his ship. Now, as you said earlier, let's get down to cases. Peratep is alive and sealed in an airlock. If you don't return the necklace, I'll decompress that airlock and kill her. I see. How do you want us to proceed? Dr. Cassidy and Amontef will deliver the necklace in an unarmed ship. Amontef knows my location. And whom? Don't try any of your tricks. Decompression is a singularly horrible way to die. What are you going to do, Foom? Elementary, my dear drone. I'm going to beat Moriarty at his own game. Amontef, come with me. I'd like to have a word with you in private. Two hours later, Amontef leaves Foom's quarters and returns to Starlab Control. From there, he and Mora descend to Launch Bay 15, board the Deep Space Laboratory ship Octavia, and blast off for the Limehouse Express. Nine hours later, the Octavia enters Martian space and moves into a side-by-side -side position with Moriarty's huge flying wing. As the two ships float in the airless void between Diamos and Phobos, an enclosed Metalflex walkway telescopes from the Octavia to the personnel hatch of the Limehouse Express. After pressurizing the walkway interior, Mora stabilizes its atmosphere. A moment later, the two ships open their airlock. Piratep, your forehead. Don't concern yourself, Amantef. The wound is superficial. Thank Ra for that. Go into the ship now and rest. You're very pleased with yourself, aren't you, Professor? And why shouldn't I be? I not only have the necklace, but I've outsmarted Sona Tifum as well. You're no match for Mr. Foom. Your cruelty defeated him, not your intelligence. You're an ugly little man, Professor. Ugly and arrogant and stupid. Sticks and stones, Dr. Cassidy. Sticks and stones. Hey, it's time, Professor. All right. Tell your men to return to their stations. May I hold the necklace one last time? Of course, Amonte. I'm as sentimental as the next man, in spite of my overweening ugliness. Would you like to hold it, Mora? Why, yes. Yes, thank you. Professor? Yes? <coughs> Amontef! Into the ship, Mora. I'll bring the professor. Guards! Guards! Hold his wrists a little closer together, Amontef. 
good. There. Watching you walk into Jastrow Prison is going to be a pleasure, Professor. Mm. Amontev, how did the descendant of an ancient Egyptian high priest manage to become a master of oriental martial arts? In much the same way that I became a master of disguise, Mora. Practice. Here, hold my nose. Mr. Foom! Shh! You'll wake Piratep. Why didn't you tell me? If you had known it was me disguised as Amontef, you might have behaved differently aboard Moriarty's ship. Um, here, uh, help me peel off this beard. My fingernails are all sort of... Mora! Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Foo. Oh, that's all right. I'm sure I'll be as good as new when they remove the bandages. What did Amontef say when you told him what you intended to do? He smiled his most seraphic smile and gave me his blessing. He's quite an extraordinary man, you know. While we were talking, I asked him why the Egyptian civilization was brought to Earth in the first place. And he said, to create a sense of wonder, Mr. Foom. A sense of wonder so compelling as to cause those generations still unborn to look at history with new insight and see the universe with new eyes. Eyes that will one day look back at ancient Egypt and understand what we tried to do there. And on that day, realize that they are looking back into the future. The Adventure of the Egyptian Necklace was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guest stars Philip Clark, John Abbott, Lester Fletcher, Carol Bilger, and Joe Baker. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs, assistant to the producer Jim Cook, technical consultant Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. The Adventure of the Egyptian Necklace is dedicated to the memories of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of England's most famous consulting detective. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, Time Clash, from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds.